Good morning, guys. Um, man, I've been asked by a whole bunch of people to talk about you know, trauma. I've been I've been an advocate, obviously, for veteran issues, but more so as a human being, being sympathetic and an advocate for people getting through difficult times. I mean, trauma is trauma is not specific to veterans. It's not specific to people who have served in war. Trauma effectively affects everybody on the planet in some shape, form, or fashion. Maybe there's an idea in popular culture that people are somehow immune to this and that a hierarchy of people, maybe even a social class, is even more so. Maybe the idea is the more money you make, the more immune you are to mental health issues related to Trump. It's actually the complete opposite. Some of the happiest people on the planet are some of the poorest people on the planet. So there's not a direct correlation between wealth, even status, and happiness, or the lack thereof, depression and mental health issues associated with trauma. So, just some context. This is a conversation. I hope, I hope you guys are in a comfortable place to listen. I grew up in a world in the military, and that's what I reflect back on my life. Like, if you were to ask me the top ten memories of my life, eight of those probably are associated with the military in some, some way. Probably all eight of those memories, and these are my most significant memories, are associated with combat, with war. So this isn't a sob story in, in, by any means, in whatsoever. I, I volunteered for the military. I volunteered for special operations, specifically the Army side of that, as a Green Beret. And I wanted to go to a lot of people who were in my position wanted to be in war. I joined the army as an infantryman at 17 with this idea that I would fight and defend my country. Whether you agree with that or not, that's my story. I actually remember as a young infantryman, I used to be into writing poetry and I wrote a poet, poem about war. And I remember I had an account on military.com on a forum and I had posted that, and people were kind of attacking me. I don't know, attacking is a pretty bold statement. But people were commenting and aggressively giving me feedback on how uh, war was hell, and you don't want to be a war bomb. And I didn't think I wrote the poem in that, in that way, uh, because I wasn't a monger of war. I didn't want to see death destruction, kind of like the worst symptom of um, collapse and the lack of sovereignty, which is war. I didn't want to see that. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to be part of it because I had a fighting spirit like many young men in the world. I've been to Libya, Yemen, all these Middle Eastern, Third World countries, even in Africa. Young men are raised in a lot of cultures to allow this fighting spirit to transcend their life, to be part of their life. So when I actually went to war, I realized the concepts of war that I had, the idea and the romanticism that I associated with war, probably because of Hollywood, popular culture at the time, uh, music, art, um, Hollywood movies, that it wasn't like that. There was no glory in war. But there were very definitive moments, speaking to those eight, eight specific memories, where I felt like I was living a purpose and fulfilled life. Like I was doing what I was born to do. And I always thought that as a young child, like that, that was my my role, my objective. 
And so I, I lived that and there was no surprises there. I, I felt like I was where I needed to be. And, and maybe you relate to that. A lot of people might relate to that. Um, if you've ever kind of lived your dream or it could be a relationship, it could be a career field, it could be, I don't know, whatever your imagination has a vision of, when you're living that, nothing feels like struggle. Nothing feels like hardship. So when I started losing friends, um, one of my good friends, which I wear this bracelet, Ben Bittner, uh, was killed in Afghanistan. Um, some of these relationships that I had with these men and the loss of their life sat it didn't destroy me it sad me it sad me for their families for their wives for their kids I remember when Ben died I went to his uh, wife's house in April and I was with her and their newborn son and their newborn son uh, who was an infant uh, I decided to give a bath in the sink in the kitchen. And April was dealing with, all, with, a, with a lot of spouses that lose um, service members, their, their, their loved ones deal with, all the politics, and all the BS that is the military system um, for taking care of, of spouses. So I remember like in the background, the noise of her crying, sometimes screaming at people on the phone, and kind of the silence that I was immersed in, holding Ben's child, his baby boy, looking out the back window of their property in North Carolina. And on this property, they had goats. I remember looking out and seeing the goats, and seeing their dogs, and realizing for April, but for myself, he would never experience those memories anymore. To feed the goats, to pet his dogs, to love his baby boy. And that affected me right then and there. It, it scarred me. I felt like for the first time, um, it scarred me. And this was outside of the, the, the actual battlegrounds that are in the war. So when I have that memory and reflect on it, I did a lot of suppressing of that specific memory in my own head. I didn't want to deal with it at the time because I was trying to take care of Ben's wife. I was also PCSing or going to another unit to become a team sergeant and to take care of my team. So I had a, a whole bunch of responsibility that was burdensome. And, and to be honest, like in that field, you don't have a lot of time to mourn. So what we do is we suppress all the things that we we're supposed to deal with and then we move on. But we don't really have the luxury of time in that career field. In, in the civilian world, we, we actually have a luxury of time in, in many cases with things that we deal with. But again, we, we think we have these very unique skill sets and defensive mechanisms to be able to deal with this kind of shit. But they're poor defensive mechanisms. Maybe, maybe they're primal. Maybe they're things that we used to do in a primal and ancestral state where it was hunters and gatherers. Things were very simple. So we don't talk about things emotional emotional things. What I've realized through all my experiences in war, through all my experiences in trauma, is that things start to stack. And then when you take the suppression of trauma, which is expected in life, by the way, one thing we all have in common is our shared experiences in trauma, in sadness, in pain. It's common to all. So don't feel like you're in a unique position just because you're feeling depressed or you lost a loved one because that happens to us all. 
And to those that it hasn't happened to yet, it will. So there are things that you can do in preparation. One, by understanding kind of the process and how this works. But also, if you're dealing with the suppression of these issues and stacking all the other things that are residual. What I mean in residual is it's like the constant white noise that's in the background. We, we live actually in a constant state of stress. That's a, a means of our survivability in the modern world. When you're driving a car, when you're looking at your phone, when you're observing anything, you have a mild level of stress to be prepared to react, respond, and to survive. What we like to do though, is in this suppression, is we like to take on all of these difficult things that we deal with, and we don't like to deal with them. And so we suppress them, um, and we only have one category for that suppression. So what happens is the trauma that you've experienced in childhood, maybe in war, compounded with the trauma and experiences that you face in your workplace, in your relationships, whatever it may be, your insecurities, the way that you think people perceive you, all of those things start to stack in the same category and it starts to push down on the most traumatic things that you faced in your life that you never dealt with in the first place. A good psychologist will walk you through this cognitive understanding and process to make you better understand what's happening in real time so you can address it. Address it. And I'm speaking from my own experiences with psychologists. One of the best psychologists that I ever talked to was at the VA, Veteran Affairs, who had lost both his legs in Vietnam as a long-range patrol infantryman while serving in war. So it, it's very hard for me to look at my own trauma when I'm physically, for the most part, healthy, while a psychologist who lost both of his legs in war is talking to me about my hardship. Right? It, it was a unique experience, but good psychologists will tell you that if you understand what's happening in real time, then you can make a plan or have a plan in place to be able to deal with what's happening. So, for example, if you feel anxiety, maybe a pressure in your chest, a shortness of breath, then you can go into automatic breathing that's conscious. You can start thinking about um, other things that are going to take you away from being inside your head. I've been depressed. Prior to being depressed, I've never experienced depression, but I've seen depression. And I was often the one judging people who were depressed as being weak because I really didn't understand what it was until I experienced it. What it is is a chemical process that we all deal with in some form or fashion, but in the depressive state is one of the most significant challenges for people to kind of come out of. If you've ever been depressed, you have no energy. You don't want to eat. You don't want to breathe. Thinking about doing anything is difficult. You only want to lay there under your blankets and not really address anything in your life. I've been in that state where every single breath seemed labored, where every single moment I was fighting to stay in it versus checking out. And when I mean checking out, I mean suicide. I mean, when you live in a, a world of perceived value and then you look at yourself as being somebody who doesn't provide any value because you're, you're a lost cause, because you're, you're a wreck, because your girlfriends, because your family, because you, maybe they didn't even say so, they just think so, or you, you know so. That tends to break us down even more. And one of the outs that we look for is justifying us not existing. So we say to ourselves, oh, well, I'm not a value. I don't even deserve to be here. I'm just burdening my loved ones, so I need to check out. So then we kill ourselves. A lot of people do that. Every single day it happens. And it's tragic because what people who kill themselves don't understand because they're not around to understand it is killing yourself is 
giving a life sentence of trauma to the ones that love you. Even if you don't think they love you, they do love you. So I have many friends that have killed themselves because of the things they were dealing with and that has grossly affected me in many negative ways, some positive ways, but many negative ways. So you're giving a life sentence to all those around you who truly love you. And so if you're looking at it from a, um, you know, a value add, maybe a liability versus an asset, you're becoming more of a liability because now you're just burdening everybody that loved you forever. And that's a tax that you can never take back. So how do you get out of a depressed state? How do you fight through it? Here's what helped me. Again, I'm not a psychologist. I study on psychology. I, I talk about it in seminars and lectures. Uh, academically, I have, you know, my degree is in Homeland Security and Crisis Response, and I'm an expert in that, strategically and tactically. But I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a mental health expert. Speaking from my own experience, here's what has worked for me. One, getting outside of your head. If you want to start to rebuild, reorganize what you think you've lost mentally, because you feel like you're you're so um, you're so lost in your own head, you have to get outside of it in order to start that repair. What I used to do. Um, when I heard my voice start leading me down a road, I had a third party. This sounds bizarre, but uh, but hear me out. We all have this like subconscious voice. Some people call it our consciousness. It's this voice in the back of our head that communicates. A lot of people don't realize the benefit and the distress that voice can cause in building insecurity, but also building confidence. If that voice on autopilot is allowed to run on its own, it will potentially destroy you, meaning talk you into things that you really shouldn't be talked into. Why not drink another glass of whiskey? Why not pop another pill to dull the pain, right? That voice is that, let's just call it the, that, that second tier of voice voices. So it's almost like a, a narrator in a sense convincing you of things that you need to do. If you are conscious to that voice, then you can be the third party. You can be the voice that that is sitting back in the back of the room observing that voice in all its destructive ways. Where it's saying, yeah, you are a liability. You're, you are worthless. You are ugly. You don't need to be here. Whatever it is, listen to that voice and allow it to run on autopilot, but at the first opportunity, start to step in when appropriate and stop that voice. Yeah, it sounds crazy, right? But it's actually something that you could do on your own. Because if you just are conscious to the voice inside your own head, then you understand that you have control, that you're not uh, limited or constrained by the control of that one mechanism talking you into everything negative. You now have the power because you're narrating or choreographing the entire conversation. When that voice starts to lead you down a, a dark road, be a person of action to physically do something about it. Here's what I mean. Instead of talking yourself into drinking more alcohol or taking another pill or being self-destructive, not answering your phone, not texting buddies, uh, insulating yourself, closing the door, under the blanket, all of those things that that voice wants you to do, have a plan of action as an immediate action where when that voice creeps in, that you do something about it physically. So if it says, get that bottle of whiskey, you get up and you start doing burpees. You get up and you start doing push-ups. You get up and you go for a walk. You get up and you call a loved one. You get up and do something positive that's gonna counteract that negative state that you potentially will be in. Remember, we live like we, we're a bundle of chemicals that kind of operate throughout the world, picking up different chemicals, positive, negative, and it, and it can put ourselves out of balance if we got too much negative. You wanna get more positive? Hug a person that you love. Hell, hug anybody. 
talk to somebody. Get these positive chemicals in your system to allow you to balance out the negativity. You're gonna need them. The second thing I did was I started yoga. Look, I'm, I'm a big ass guy. I'm 6'1", 230, 240 pounds. I've always been this big dude who's not very good at stretching or yoga. So when I look at yoga, uh, I, I thought it was a girl thing. But I don't know what made me go to yoga, but I was down in a dark hole, literally on the floor New Year's Eve by myself with a bottle, empty bottle of wine. And I don't even drink wine. Um, depressed, out of my mind, not in a very good state. So I decided to take a yoga class. I took a 90 minute class of hot yoga. And I'm big into fitness, or I was, before all this started taking place. And it broke me off. I went through a gallon of water. I sweated profusely. I almost purged in a way. Purging is like this release of all this toxic um, energy. I purged in a way because I was able to feel like I was releasing something. And then in return, as I was drinking all this water, I was gaining something. It was like a cleansing. Not to mention, there was attractive women in the class in yoga pants. And I'm a male. I was able to socially interact with people and feel normal, kind of again. Now, now all these people in my acting state didn't realize, like, hey, I was living in a state of depression in my apartment down the road. But that experience changed my life. It helped me one day, one breath at a time, capture my soul and spirit back. It's something that I felt like I lost. Something beneficial about yoga too is this state of consciousness, staying in the moment consciously and then collecting your breath. Uh, I teach in survival, when you're going through a flight or flight state that's t activated by cortisol, you suppress your breath. And so often we go around the world in this mild to high level of stress, constantly depriving ourselves of oxygen. If you have the opportunity to collect yourself, and to restore your oxygen through breathing techniques, it's gonna help you and yoga can teach you that. There's a whole bunch of positive things that you can do. One of the things that was a misnomer that I thought was the answer was getting out in nature. Somebody said, hey man, get out in nature and experience the outdoors, it'll make you better. It did the opposite. Because when I was out in nature by myself, the only thing I had without any tactics address the voice inside my head, the only thing I did was dig that hole deeper and then looked around my surroundings was like, man, it's beautiful here. I can check out here. Suicide's a serious problem, but it's something that we need to talk more about. Depression's a serious problem. It's something that we need to talk about more often. Being under COVID-19 restrictions has made it more difficult for people to do those positive things that are going to benefit their mental health. If you know anybody who's suffering or you think intuitively is suffering, please pick up your phone and call them. Better yet, go knock on their door and have a conversation with them. You might just save somebody's life. Have a good day, guys.